Uh, man, it's good to see everybody here in the Lord's house tonight. Um, I had a great day. We had to see you at the poll. Had a lot of kids there. Um, had a good prayer this morning and, and, uh, and uh, another blessed evening here at church and um, survived another Wednesday night. So uh, it's good to see everybody. You know, um, one of the things that uh, this, this passage that we're going to go over tonight in Romans 12, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is where, where you, if you've if you got your Bibles with you tonight, this is where we're going to be. And, and Romans chapter 12 is a, all the book of Romans is fascinating, but I love chapter 12. And, and the first, we're only going to get through two verses, uh, Lord willing. And in the question I want to ask you tonight, um, are you a conformer or a transformer? And the Apostle Paul's going to ask this question here tonight. And the greatest threat that Satan uses, and we're seeing it so much in today's world, is conformity. You, you're seeing it everywhere. Conformity is, 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 the, is the thing that he does uh, the most significant thing that Satan does to try to counter the Holy Spirit and, 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 and trying to counter um, uh, the message of Christ is conformity. And you're seeing it today. You're seeing it like crazy. Um, and, and, and what Paul is going to argue is if you allow the Holy Spirit to transform your mind, okay, and renew your mind, uh, you're not going to conform to this world. So think about how America is trying to conform us today. Think about the things that they did. You saw it during COVID. You see it with this, this whole nonsense of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the climate nonsense that's going on, and they're trying to get everybody conformed. Everybody's trying to tell you that you shouldn't eat beef. And like I saw a little deal, and you guys might have seen this little post I put out on Facebook or Twitter, I can't remember, where, you know, God saved all the cows when, he, when Noah built the ark, but he didn't save any heads of lettuce. Can somebody shout amen right there? Okay, he saved the cows, all right? So, so the society is trying to get us to form, but we know that this is Satan. But I think one of the greatest uh, stories we're not going to talk about tonight in conformity is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Imagine that picture where, where thousands and thousands of people are bowing down Okay, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, they're standing. They're standing while everybody else is dealing. And the title of our message tonight is, Are You Conformed or Transformed? And we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read God's word here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. And Father, we just, I thank you for the blessings of this church. I thank you for the blessings uh, with our children tonight. I thank you for the blessings of uh, to see you at the poll rally this morning at the high school and and uh, Lord, I just pray that you just give this word tonight to the to folks that are here and also to the people that are watching online, Lord. And we love you and we praise you and we hallow your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to start here, and I li- I'd like to look at this very first word here, or the first two words, I beseech, okay? Now, when you look at the word beseech, Paul is, he's, he, he is he's saying this is urgent. This is really, really important. I beseech you. <clears throat> This means, uh, this, this has got an exclamation point on it. Paul is, uh, uh, then Paul's going to say one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, I beseech you, therefore. And you know, what is the therefore? Okay, so this is going to get back to what beseech is. And that is of dedication. And the dedication that you have to have in Christ once we accept Christ as Lord. I beseech you. Okay, this is that basis for that relationship. And, and the question we want to ask ourselves is, if you are in Christ, and Paul is saying right here, those who are in Christ, okay, I beseech you, he's telling us that you need to be all in. Once you accept Christ, you, you, you can't ride Balaam's donkey into the kingdom. You've got to be all in. You've got to be all in. You can't be a, 
uh, you can't be uh, uh, halfway in, in the gate and halfway not. Paul is saying, I beseech you. That means it's important. Once you accept Jesus, you've got to be all in. This is true dedication. But notice what he says here. What it says here. All right? Look what he says here. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Okay, he's going to give us, he's going to outline just in this beautiful verse here. He's going to outline something right here. Three things. He's telling us what to do. You've got to present your body as a living sacrifice. Okay, the second thing is we've got to be holy. And the third is reasonable service. Okay, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. We're going to start with how you present your body as a living sacrifice. What does this mean? You know, Paul is always using athletic uh, metaphors. You, you, you know, you're how you present your body and how you present yourself. And if we put our faith, we put our faith in Christ, we use, before, before we did that, we would use our bodies for sinful pleasures and purposes. However, now that we belong to Him, our bodies are a temple. We desire our bodies for the glory of God. Christians have become, because the Holy Spirit is residing in us, and we need to use our bodies as a temple. And this verse present means present once and for all and for the ages to come. It commands us, God commands us to make a commitment to our bodies just like a bride and groom make a commitment to themselves at their wedding service. Think about it like this. But look what he says here, a living sacrifice. These words are important. Now, think about this. It's essential that we offer our bodies as living sacrifices for the Holy Spirit to use to accomplish God's will. Now, think about this. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were many times they were lifeless. But today, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we're here on earth, okay, uh, there are two examples of living sacrifices. If you go, go back in time and look in the Old Testament, one of them is a, a living sacrifice was Abraham. You know, when he brought a son of Isaac to the mount to, to uh, offer him as a sacrifice. And what happened? God, uh, at the last minute, uh, provided a ram for that sacrifice. But, but, but here's the thing. Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Then the ultimate sacrifice happened when God did sacrifice his son and when, he, when Jesus died on the cross. Though Isaac didn't physically die, he did die for himself because he surrendered to God's will, or Abraham surrendered to God's will. Okay, But notice here what he says here. Holy and acceptable to God. I want to ask you this question. We always say holy in churches. What does it mean to be holy? Being holy means, you know what it means in the end when you look at the Hebrew interpretation of holy? Holy means separate. Now think about that for a second. Holy means separate. So you're separating yourself from the world, right? Okay, that's, that, that's what holy means. It means you separate yourself from the world. Be set apart, okay? You, nothing in, uh, unclean, nothing impure, okay? Think about this. The Lord sets the standard on what holy is. He's done this. He, he is the ultimate source of holiness. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, There is no one holy like Jehovah. The term holy was ambiguously denotes that 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 that. that that God has particularly reserved holy places for his worship. Remember what he said to Moses on the burning bush in Exodus 3, 2. You are standing on holy ground. Remember Moses took his boots off. He took his sandals off. How can an imperfect person like us, like me or you or anybody here in the room tonight, uh, can, how can we, can we be holy? We can't but we must strive to be, but we can be holy someday in Him. 1 Peter 1.16 says, You must be holy because why? I am holy. This is the word from Jesus. But notice what He says here for reasonable service. You see that reason? What is reasonable service? When I was looking through this, I asked myself, once and for all, a commitment determines what we do with our bodies, a reasonable service. What is that reasonable service? He is saying, I beseech you, therefore, because look at what God has done for us. 
I mean, if you think about it in context, what has God done for us once we accept him? First of all, he's given you eternal life. You're never going to die. You're going to live forever. The second thing he's going to do for you, when you get up to heaven, man, you're going to live like a king. You're part of the kingdom. And you're going to do that for eternity. So when, when Paul says, I beseech you, can you just give him a little bit while you're here on earth? You see what I'm saying? I mean, but we never think about it that way. What is this reasonable service? And this is not just a, how do, you know, how do, how do you apply a reasonable service? It means, it means that when all the other churches are, are, are caving to the cancel culture for clicks, are caving to money and power and popularity, and pastors uh, do things for popularity. They do things for clicks. They do things for political reasons. Just as Jesus Christ took on the human body to fulfill God's will, we must yield our bodies to Christ. Yes, indeed. The question becomes, how do you do that in 21st century America? It means giving up our rights, our rights to your body and letting God use your body for his purpose and not Scott's purpose. It only took me 50 years to figure this out. Now, I want everybody to understand this is not just an individual act, but he wants us to do this as a church, collectively as a church, as a community. But notice what he says here in, in, in uh, verse 2. And do not be, this is very important here, conformed to this world, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, when you look at conformity, we've talked about conformity. Are you conformed or transformed? Pastor J.B. Phillips said this, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Think about that statement for a second. It can happen so easily. It can happen so easily with our kids, which is a Greek term. Conform is schizmoziti. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it means to form according to the pattern or a mold, like Play-Doh. You remember that Play-Doh used to play with his kids, and you could, you, could, you could form that. You know what's fascinating about this verse is Peter almost said the exact same thing in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 14, when he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. Think about this. What exactly do Paul and Peter mean by telling Christians not to conform to the world? Ask yourself that question. Christians must firmly resist conforming to the corrupt customs, to the ungodly principles that's happening all across it's happening all across uh, America today. Ungodly principles, evil plans of action promoted by worldly men. We're going to cave on abortion. We're going to say, well, you know what, brother? You're, let's just take the wins on abortion, okay? Let's just take the wins on 15 weeks. Let's just take the wins on 15 weeks. This is how we got to do this as brothers, okay? No, it's not how we got to do this as brothers. Let's take it from conception. Can somebody say amen? But if, you're, if, you, if you are called from conception... All right, and you say it's murder, well, you're a bondist. You're, you're a fundamentalist. <laughs> We've got people in our own association that disagree with that term. I don't. I want to tell you right now, uh, the, 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 the birth starts at conception, period, and you will never get me to change my position from here. Amen? Ever. Okay? So don't compromise on this 15 weeks, and don't tell me I'm a bad brother because I'm not going to compromise on it. 15 weeks is wrong. You remember the story, in, and I'm, gonna, I'm preaching on something totally else now, <laughs> just because I, <laughs> I got fired up. But, you know, <laughs> it's like when uh, John the Baptist, when John the Baptist and um, uh, uh, was in, in uh, John's mother, Elizabeth, uh, saw her niece, Mary. John was in the womb of Elizabeth, Mary, uh, Jesus was in the womb of Jesus. Most scholars believe Jesus was conceived <coughs> by the Holy Spirit. He was about two weeks old at the time. And what did John the Baptist do when he was about six, his mother was about six months pregnant? When he came in contact with the baby Jesus, he started doing cheetah flips, right? 
in Elizabeth's womb. So don't tell me about this 50. We're not going to conform to the world. We're not going to conform to the world on this whole trans nonsense. We're not going to conform to the world. If you, if you, if you, if you uh, uh, operate on a child that's younger than 18, I'll just tell you, that is a crime. That is an absolute crime. And those doctors should be charged. And I hope that YouTube uh, sees this right now. I hope they see it on Facebook. Okay, we're not going to conform to this world. This is what it means. We're blessed is the one who does not walk in the step and the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take or sit in the company of mockers. The Psalms have said that. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. But as a boat floats on water, it's not a part of the water. You see what I'm saying? We don't, we're not like them. The Christian life is, is in the world, but it's not of the world. Christians follow the example of Jesus, not the principles of the world. The Bible describes being under the control of the devil, referred to as the God of this world. This world is not the physical world. Rather, it's an action or an age. If you think about it, the Bible says Christians are delivered from this present age of evil. And when we are saved, we are delivered from this. But if you think about it, guys, and I'm going to talk about it this Sunday, you know when we get saved, you know what we're saved from? We're not saved from Satan. No. We're saved from God. So much shout out amen right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're saved from God because he's the one that's going to judge us, right? He is, he's the one that's going to judge the wicked, okay? And you're either going to be with Satan or you're going to be with God. But here's the deal. The key to escaping the world's grip of conformity lies in this, this verse right here. Is accomplished through this work right here by renewing your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Who does that? The Holy Spirit does. Having the Holy Spirit present in us, letting the Holy Spirit do these things. It's interesting to note that, that Paul says we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I'll tell you guys, the mind's the key to the Christian life. The gospel calls the unbeliever to repent of his sins, embrace Christ's faith. You know what the Greek word uh, translated is? Repentance carries a notion. It's what it is. A change of mind. A change of mind. Isn't that fascinating? Repentance, a change of mind. I'm repenting of my sins. I'm changing my mind. Our thinking must be changed from old to the ungodly to the ways, new ways of thinking. We know in our minds to be valid forms of convictions. That's why we emphasize in our church. And I'm so blessed that early on in my preaching, I got to go to some seminars that really focused on expository preaching, just like we're doing tonight. You're only taking two verses, but... Every single word of this verse was inspired by the Holy Spirit. When we go word by word, verse by verse, singing the, the God's word can be valuable also. There are no shortcuts. There's no magical formula to reviewing our mind. It comes with prayer. It comes with worship. And it comes with Bible study. Sanctifying them in the truth. Your word is the truth, John 17, 17. In closing... To rectify the flawed thinking of the world, we must replace it with the truth that's right here. And that's God's truth. It's revealed right here in this book. My goal for you guys and, and in the church and for me and, and is when we're preaching a message, whether it's on Wednesday night or Sunday morning, my hope and my prayer for all of you here and those watching online, is I want you to have a love affair with this book. I want you to love to, to love to just grab this book in your spare time. Understand the unique chapters in this book and let the Holy Spirit communicate to you. Because whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're going through, the answer is right here. Whatever that is, whatever stage of life that you're in with your family, or as individuals, when we transform our minds and we renew our way of thinking, it's essential that we engage in this word. With every head bowed and all eyes closed, Father God, I thank you. Thank you for this time tonight. I thank you for this message you laid on my heart tonight. I thank you for the, the academic rigor that you put me through to 
to write this script and, and, and learn. And I thank you for the time and prayer. I thank you for the blessings, so many blessings, Lord, that you've given this church, our community. Father, I know we've got people hurting. They're watching us tonight. I know there's people in our church hurting right now, whether it's a sickness or things that are happening around them with their children, maybe at their work. Father, I just pray that you would just let them give it to you, all of it. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I'm God. Let us be still. Let us bring this to you, Lord. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. We ask these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.